Well, independent journalism is under attack, with journalists being threatened with legal action, prison sentences, or worse, killed. Tucker Carlson, of course, has been threatened with sanctions, prison time, because he had the audacity to fly to Moscow, interview Vladimir Putin, and show the world how Western sanctions against Russia aren't working. Independent journalist, American journalist, George Eliasson, lives in the Donbass, which has been under constant attack by Ukraine for the last decade. The people there voted, of course, to leave Ukraine and become part of Russia, and he knows a thing or two about being targeted by the corporate media for telling the truth. George has just launched a brand new news outlet called Intelligencer, which you can see here, and you can find at intelligencer.today. And George joins us now to talk about journalism, the state of journalism, and this new venture. George, great to see you, my friend. Thank you for having me on, Clayton. My pleasure, my pleasure. So I think first, you know, let's start with, there's massive discussions about journalism right now, given Tucker's recent trip to Moscow. And it certainly shined a bright light on independent journalists and what that exactly means. And the mainstream media, the corporate media, is in a bit of a panic mode about the future, I think, of journalism, criticizing him and running un unbelievable hit pieces on him. But it's not really about Tucker. It's really about it's really about alternative media and the rise of independent journalism. What was your, first of all, your, your response to seeing this, this crying by the corporate media about Tucker in, in Moscow? Well, you know, one of the marks of, of real journalism, investigative journalism, uh, interviews or otherwise, is that it makes a lot of people unhappy, especially government officials, okay? Um, that used to be the case. But now when an independent journalist with Tucker's credentials, with his background, and quite frankly, it's lengthy. We're not talking about someone that started yesterday. Uh, what's it go back, 25 years? Yeah, we're longer. He's yeah, I mean, been, right, out of, right out of college, yes, as a journalist, a writer. He's, you know. been, he's been, he earned... Um, I wouldn't say a media star, but as a journalist, unlike a lot of the people today, he earned um, his position in the environment, in that ecology. And for all these people to do that, now it's not jealousy. It's because you have editors that are coming, on down, coming down on them for their byline. Do this or don't do this. You have a job or you don't have a job he's going to put us out of business. Um, look what happened with Fox when he left Fox. Look what's going on with the pre-release of his interview. What's that up to? 60, 60 million views or some such? Or yeah. And climbing? It's insane. Right. He would get 3 million and, views on his nightly show on Fox. So just, just mm -hmm. his version of the clip on X has tens of millions of views. How many other people then exactly. repurposed the video and published it on YouTube, then repurposed it all over X? That has tens mm -hmm. of millions of views. Exactly. And uh, we republished it to support what he's doing, um, honestly. And that's what it's about, is supporting it. He's a journalist. It's, it's his um, spotlight right now. And it needs to be only, only him. And the fact that the matter is, um, the reason why, part of the reason this is getting this reaction, and you're not going to get it from any other journalist that has interviewed Putin or will interview Putin, is because it is Tucker Carlson. And they're afraid, really afraid, because he's going to ask real questions. He's going to ask deep questions. He's going to ask meaningful questions um, for the American public. That's his audience. And Tucker isn't just um, a journalist, he's also a political, he's very, very savvy. And what he says does affect policy. And quite frankly, they should be scared. Because however this interview turns out, it's not going to be lightweight. It's not going to be comfortable, and it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be for anybody. But it is necessary because Look at what's happening in America today with journalism, censorship, propaganda, information war. It's not just a matter of what side is coming from, the news is coming from or not, like it was 30 years ago. Is it CNN or is it Fox? 
it's all the same narrative bought and paid for by people behind the scenes that want the wars, that want to make enemies that aren't enemies of the United States. Now, should Vladimir Putin um, please Americans? He's not the president of, of the United States. His job is to take care of Russians. The problem in America today is we have a president, we have policymakers, we have a State Department, we have an um, intelligence infrastructure that think they're Ukrainian. And we should be worried about that. It's not Putin. It's what's going on in the United States. And that's what this is going to reveal. You that's talk what about people are afraid of. They are afraid of it. And you talk about some of the tools. In fact, you uh, on the Intelligencer, just you have a new piece. I encourage our viewers to go over and read it. But I just want to put this up here on the screen because I think some of the tools that maybe most people, when they, you know, they read a CNN.com article or they read some other propaganda by the U.S. media, maybe they're not aware of the tools that are being used by the intelligence community that are infiltrating these newsrooms that are a part of this mechanism. So I just want to put this up here on your screen. I pulled this out of a, a piece on the intelligencer's website. This willful deployment of language to sterilize and dehumanize a victim or indeed an entire ethnicity is by no means accidental. It's an essential element of a psychological endeavor to tip the scales in the viewer's subconscious calculation of culpability. It's simple to consider the elimination of terrorists as justifiable. We're going to go after the terrorists. Right? It's an easy moniker, right? As you write. Whereas the mass killing of many thousands of defenseless children, women, elderly, and sick is a far harder task to sell to an increasingly informed Western public. The manipulation of the Western client media is by no means a departure from the norm. Can you explain that? The American public is being so manipulated. Um, people that, you know, honestly, they're not even thinking about the United States, never mind harming them, are being put in the forefront as not just potential terrorists we need to watch, but people we need to kill. And they're using these tools to well, I guess change the landscape of the world would hmm. be the easiest way to put it. Right. So if you look at the Palestinian situation and you've got the big pro-Israel uh, lobby in the United States and the um, Palestinians have been labeled as a group, terrorists, as a nationality. These, this is a terrorist group and organization. But nobody actually cared to look at who these Palestinians are. In the media, if you look at them, the best you'll come up with, well, the Islamists brought them in. They're Arabs that were brought in. But if you look at the Jewish population that are in Israel today that came out of the Holocaust camps, um, the world of, of um, the Judaism of Jewish people um, not very long ago, was concentrated in Eastern Europe. More than 90% of the world's Jews were there. Okay? What people understand is that if you look at the Palestinians, for the Jews to be able to say, this is our people, this is our bloodlines, they have to look at um, the actual DNA of the Palestinians who were there, which is the same DNA as the real, I guess, um, Jewish populations from the Eastern European area, okay, uh, Belarus, Ukraine, Poland, specifically those areas, the DNA matches. It goes back to Babylon, Persia, um, Baghdad, and that's the trace. If it matches up, they are the same people. So who are the Palestinians? And other than ancient Israelis that converted to different religions over time. And this is a fact. Um, the studies on it have been pretty clear. So you're kicking one population, demonizing one part of the population. It is part of the population. 
in favor of the other pop part of the population based on a notion of religion. When in fact, we should be looking at the rights of the people. You look at what's going on in Gaza right now. I mean, it is, it, it's beyond horrendous. And, you know, I've been in a war zone for 10 years. Uh, this is a hundredfold, a thousandfold from what well, I've seen. Well, worse than what you've seen in the Donbass. Yeah. And I've been through, my gosh, four mass grave recoveries. Um, you know, I couldn't think of anything worse than um, they're recovering bodies and there's the, the, the remains of a child. Right. And right now this is going on live and everything that um, is being done in media to demonize the Palestinians, to demonize the, the Russians. Um, if you want to look at diplomacy today, the world's most trusted diplomat is Lavrov. One of the most trusted leaders in the world is Vladimir Putin. It's not Joe Biden. It's not anyone out of the State Department. And you have to ask yourself, why? What's the reason? 30 years ago, we fooled ourselves. We had the moral high ground. And in the United States, that word was our bond. It's just not that way anymore. Um, U.S. diplomats tend to sound like Bill Cat today. Uh, are you familiar with, I think it was Gary Larson's Bill Cat? Mm -hmm. Okay. Screaming, Ack! All right. Russian diplomats negotiate. They talk diplomacy. And if you look at it over time, you don't have to take my word for it. You don't have to like it. As a matter of fact, I, it'd be better off if you didn't. But if you look at it as a plain simple, what are the facts? If they say something, they mean something. If they say they're going to do something, they do something. Right. If they say this is a red line, don't cross it, they're not going to back it up. They're not going to back off from it. If they say we're not going to do this, we're not going here or there, like um, media screaming, they'll be in Poland next. Right. There's no interest in that. They're going to invade and, you know, all of Europe. Yeah, they're coming into Alaska. Oh yeah, oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. You, they want another. You know, what? Thirty million welfare recipients on 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 the rolls in Russia, right? Because the, what, what else would there be? What else would there be? They need the land, the biggest country in the world, most resources in the world. They certainly don't need the land. They certainly don't want a bunch of people that don't like them. I mean, you know, try, you know, you're going to rule, you're appointed a governor over Antifa or BLM. Think about it. You do want the job? No way. Can you talk about, let's talk about the intelligence here in the website. So sure. what was the gestation process for you to launch this new news outlet? What were you, oh. what struck you about, okay, there's a need for this. What, what void did you see that you said, you know what, we need, we need these voices and we need to launch this uh, to be a part of this independent landscape? Uh, there, there are a few things. If you look at the, the editorial board, it's filled with people that um, these are brilliant people that their voices have been pushed down. And we're looking at policy people, journalists, activists, we're looking at people all across the board. They've been censored. Um, they've been persecuted and prosecuted. What is the reason why um, they have something real to say? Um, as a journalist, I mean, I was writing, I was getting, you know, it's, it's not um, considered a ton, but you know, 70 to 90,000 reads an article before I spent a year trying to build this, putting it together. And it's a place where all these people, these minds can get together, interact, and the focus is on, on um, getting what they have to say out. So it's supporting their platforms too, uh, which is something that um, I'm very, very 
um, adamant on. It's not just about you know pushing up the publication itself, but it's about supporting the journalists, the board, every way we can. Uh, the need for it is how many publications, good publications, really good ones, have gone under because they were deplatformed, demonetized, um, hacked. I've had publications hacked from out, out from under me because they were publishing me. Uh, that's happened on more than one occasion. Now, can you imagine uh, submitting an article and you know, submitting to the head editor and saying, you know, you have to be honest. Uh, if you publish this, you're probably going to be deplatformed, demonetized. Right. Right. So then there goes okay. their livelihood. They're going to publish a George Eliasson article and the deep state, somebody in the intelligence community is going to hack the website and take it down. Not just hacking. You you know, in a lot of cases, you don't have to. You demonetize. Right, right. You When you lift somebody, you, you know, take away their wallet, their ability to actually do the work. And, you know, these websites, the ones that have been around for a while, it's not cheap. It's not posting an article. And people don't understand that part of that side of the business. It costs them seven, eight, ten thousand, twelve thousand, twenty thousand to be on those servers and keep them going. Right. Right. And the more reach you have so, you know, when you start mounting those costs and, you know, someone submits an article and says, oh, by the way, you may not be able to pay the bills, but right. here's the article. Right. Um, I see that people like Simona Mangiante, um, George Papadopoulos, you get the interviews, but when you need to say something, react to something, when you, it, it's not, you know, it goes beyond waiting for an interview. He has the freedom to do that. And this is inside um, this is inside the ecology that you want to publish in. And we're growing there. We're growing there. We've, we uh, partnered with Wimkin. Uh, Wimkin took over a lot of uh, Parler subscribers. Um, Nine million subscribers from Parler and we're on the front page of Wimkin. So we're getting well, we're starting to get a lot of traction, but it's to get these pieces out. Well, we hope we can give voice to this and we hope that our audience here at Redacted will go over and please subscribe, bookmark the website, follow it daily. It's intelligencer.today. It's not .com, it's .today. We'll have it linked up as well so people can subscribe. Um, I love what you're doing here. When you first told me about it, I was thrilled about it. Um, I was literally on a bus traveling when you sent me the message about launching it. And I just uh, I started reading the, the rough drafts of the website at that time about a year ago. And I thought I, I told Natalie, I said, this is exciting. This is great. So, George, Thank I'm you. really excited about it. Again, intelligencer.today. We'll have it linked up. I want people to read it, make it a part of their daily reading. Um, and support these independent journalists over there. George Eliasson, uh, always great to see you, my friend, and good luck with the, the launch of Intelligencer. Thank you so much for having me on. I really hope you enjoyed watching this video. You know, YouTube thinks that you'll actually like this next video right here. It's personalized based on your own viewing habits. So if you watch the video, please leave a comment. Let us know what you think about it, and we will see you next time, everyone.